presenting a little bit of this work which she has informed me she's worked closely with her husband on as well. So it's kind of really a joint effort, so, which is very sweet. And so it'd be lovely to hear from him uh, later on as well. So um, we'll have Catherine uh, first up to talk a little bit about um, uh, extending our circle of compassion. So thank you very much.
other goals that I, that I have. So um, it's a stand against oppression. And I'm heartened also every day by how this movement is growing and how more and more people are coming in and asking questions, getting curious and um, being part of the change. Um, so, but it's not all good news. I mean, unfortunately, the numbers suffering from the food system are larger than ever because of sheer numbers of humans and also increasing prosperity, I guess, and the value that we place on, on meat still. Um, so it's just really hard to wrap our heads around the numbers sometimes. So we say 65 billion land animals are killed each year in the, um, for food. And, you know, it kind of helps to see all those zeros just to sort of start adding up that this is one plus one plus one plus one plus one, you know, and every single one of them was somebody with a with a life and with interests of their own. Um, globally, uh, it can help to sort of break it down if you think, okay, that's 1.2 billion every week, which is more than all humans killed in all wars in all of history. That's every week. Um, and it's trillions more if you include the aquatic animals. Um, Australia kills almost 700 million every year, and um, we've got the per person numbers there as well. Um, it actually, I actually got Cameron to do, do the maths and apparently it works out as 20 approximately, 22 per second sorted in Australia, just in Australia alone, every second. So that's now and now and now and now, you know, every, every second. It, it, it is hard to get your head around. So um, I don't really want to traumatise you guys with a lot of um, detailed facts and painful imagery or anything like that. Um, I think most of us are quite aware, to some extent anyway, of what goes on in these industries. Um, it's not old McDonald's farm. I think we all kind of know that. Although there are many things that stop us from maybe facing that as much as, um, yeah, I mean, we're kind of taught not to ask those questions and not to talk about it too much. And that's partly why we get uh, vilified a little bit as vegans for talking about it too much. You know, it comes up that you're vegan and then we get the old jokes like, how do you know there's a vegan in the room? Don't worry, they'll tell you, <laughs> you know. And, um, <laughs> Where do you get your protein? <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually on that note, I do, I just said to James, I want to finish um, hopefully 10 minutes early so we can have some Q&A. Like, I, I'm not sure what mix we have in the audience and what kinds of questions, but that's just, yeah. So if I'm rambling, I... <laughs> I will try not to, so we still have time for, for, for those Q&A bits at the end. Um, but really, uh, what I suppose I want to say here is just um, just a general picture. Um, so just to dwell on the lives, you know, how they live and how they die. Um, because sadly, it is a story of great violence. Um, and it's an area where uh, our natural inclinations of compassion are stifled from an early age. Um, and the animal, the reality is these are, these are animals who are emotionally complex, intelligent beings with a potential for rich experiences of the world. Um, but most will never see the sun, feel the earth under their feet, nurture their young, build a nest, roost, forage for food, or socialize as nature intended. Um, in fact, most are actually bred to suffer because they've been genetically selected to grow too big too fast. And just one example of this is um, hens in the egg industry. They lay approximately an egg a day, but in nature, where they descended from the, the red jungle fowl, um, they would lay 12 eggs a year, one a month. <laughs> it's, it's a vast difference, and uh, there's all sorts of associated problems with that, depletion of calcium and osteoporosis, and, and Array of problems. You probably can't read all the bits around the graphic, but these are just these are what you could describe as intrinsic cruelties, because they they are problems in any type of system. This this is with egg laying hens, who are a completely different breed to the ones that are bred for meat. Not not everybody knows that eggs are not a byproduct. They're of, of you know the chicken meat industry. They're a separate breed. Um, so I could go on quite a bit about these things and the realities, I suppose, but I don't want to run out of time, and perhaps we can always come back to that if people have questions like, oh, how, how are meat chickens different, and that sort of thing. Um, and again, with their deaths, I mean, there's a, there's a process where, you know, you have to get animals who are 
They've never been taught to be trusting of humans for, for good reason. Um, even when there is an abject abuse going on, they are subjected to all sorts of painful procedures whenever a human is there. So obviously the catching process, whether they're chickens or cows, is, is stressful and traumatic for them and there's force involved, um, whether it's yeah, just grabbing chickens by one leg in large bunches of five and stuffing them into crates, which often causes breakages and dislocations, or it's cattle putting them into, into the trucks, etc. So this is, this is a violent process, there's no getting around that. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to subject you to a graphic video. Um, instead, what I wanted to do is just mention quickly uh, Brisbane Animal Save, which is one of our newest initiatives of ALQ. Um, so Animal Save is a movement um, that's global, it started in Canada, and the idea came from uh, Tolstoy, actually, the idea of bearing witness to those who, who are suffering. So I might just read a quotation from Tolstoy, which uh, sort of informed and inspired this movement. Um, he said, when the suffering of another creature causes you to feel pain, do not submit to the initial desire to flee from the suffering one. But on the contrary, come closer, as close as you can to him who suffers, and try to help. Now, we're under no illusions that we're actually going to be able to help the animal. Oh, sorry, I should explain what we do <laughs> first. We, we, we do peaceful vigils outside slaughterhouses, so we stop the trucks for a couple of minutes, even sometimes shorter, depending, you know. Um, it's, it's entirely peaceful, it's not a protest against anybody. It's, it's a vigil that's paying respect and acknowledging um, and standing in solidarity with those victims and just recognizing where they've come from, how they've traveled and where they're about to be going. So that's the primary thing. And the reason, the power of the vigil is that it's, it's public and it's standing up against what we see as a great injustice. And I think the fact that we've come to this stage with the movement is, is pretty big. I think historically we look back and say, that was a moment where people were no longer willing to go along with the turning a blind eye to, to what's going on. And um, obviously most of the time, the people that come are already pretty convinced of the reasons to, to change up, you know, personal choice and to be part of the change. But um, they're very peaceful, welcoming and gentle uh, place of like events and everybody is welcome so and there's nothing really quite like looking straight in the eyes of, of, of the, these beings because that's when you realize they're somebody not something and um, even for me who I've, you know, I've been vegan like I don't know 16 years and vegetarian since the age of nine and whatever um, so I've already been through it all um, it's still a very powerful experience for me so um, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know if it, it can move you until you've done it, but um, we have a very short video just from the last vigil that we did, and I just wanted to see if I can make that play, which would be interesting. Refreshing the page. I'll just try refreshing the page. Thank you. 
maybe. I'm, I'm extremely. Okay. That's it. Better in one
Um, so I wanted to do a whole kind of section on <coughs> the kind of misalignment of our values with our appetites. I've touched on it already, but you know, we, we all have these shared values that include, include compassion and justice, and yet and so we, and we oppose harming animals, but we still eat them. So, you know, what's going on? And I can tell the story of this graphic if there's time later, but I think I'm gonna have to skip it now. Um, and there's just a couple of concepts here that I wanted to mention. So speciesism, um, not a word that everybody will know, not a very nice sounding word, but it's like other forms of prejudice based purely on membership of a particular group. So um, it's giving lower moral status and concern to others based purely on what species they are a member of. Um, and this is borne out quite well when you think about um, why we love dogs, but we eat pigs and wear cows, which is the name of the book by Melanie Joy, who's on the left there. She's a psychologist um, who's done a lot of work and she coined the term carnism, which is specifically looking at the consumption of animals. And she described carnism as kind of a, the opposite of veganism. Um, and she says it's an invisible belief system that con conditions us to eat certain animals, and that can change depending on your culture. You know, here it's chickens, kids, turkeys, cows, etc. and sheep. In, in China, you might include dogs and cats in that, you know, it, it, it's, but it's, it's about how we've been conditioned, and it's a dominant ideology, so it tends to go unspoken or unnoticed. And um, the only ones who are thought to be bringing a, a set of ideas to the table are, are the vegans or vegetarians. But actually, um, she her, her argument is that you know, um, carnism is still a belief system as well. And um, and then she talks in detail about what she calls, um, I guess, the justifications. And and these are there's three main ends: the normal, natural, and necessary. And um, I guess. With the normal, I wanted to cover that. So, you know, it, well, yeah, it's just how we grow up. We're told you, you eat meat, but the same goes for oppressions of all kinds. Um, it, it doesn't that in itself doesn't doesn't make it okay. Um, it's, and, and the same with natural. This idea that um, that it's natural to, for humans to eat meat. I mean, there's two things there. One is you know. Natural does not give us a guide to, to our ethics. Um, and also, I would question how natural, considering the, way, the process we have to go through to, um, <laughs> to actually get to, um, to making the meat palatable for ourselves. Um, anyway, I'm running out of time and I would have liked to go a bit more into that, but um, we, yeah, I don't want to miss a chance for questions, so let me just see where we've got to. Um, ultimately, I think I, I just wanted to sort of question, ultimately, um, well, highlight that for us the key is sentience, the ability to suffer and not species membership, um, and that we can choose kindness, and this is actually, to some extent, I would, I would argue, is coming home to who we really are, and this is where the second video comes in, so I might just do that as a to end on, if, if that's cool, yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so let me see that.
we are all in different places in this journey. And because we are all unique, your place is your place. So you have to find your way home. The best we can do is to help each other as we come home to who we really are.